Ronnie Cray was buried five years ago. The East End turned out in huge numbers to honour its most notorious son. In his day, the most feared criminal in the underworld and Britain's most famous gangster. Using exclusive new information and eyewitness accounts, we can now reveal the underworld alliance that sustained the Cray firm's reign of terror. Reggie Cray, the surviving twin, was released for the day to attend the funeral. Tonight, he is 31 years, 6 months, 3 weeks and 2 days into a life sentence for murder. Among the mourners is bank robber Freddie Foreman. His partnership with the Cray firm goes back 40 years and threatened to defeat the detective who jailed the Crays. Freddie Foreman was far more involved with the Crays than I believed at the very beginning. Uh, he was a serious member of the family. I didn't realize that at the very beginning. I thought the Crays were constrained to using their own people. But Foreman was somebody that they could call upon at any time when they wanted some serious business to be perpetrated. Foreman was an evil man. He was a hitman that was open to offers. And so I think that bearing in mind his track record, 30 years imprisonment would have been justified. Foreman was one of the pallbearers. He'd just completed a prison sentence for handling money from the biggest cash robbery in British history. Tonight, he talks frankly about his career in crime and life inside the firm. Freddie Foreman had a lifelong association with the craze and became one of the most feared and ruthless criminals of his generation but he started out as an ordinary thief. After the austerity of the uh, war years, you, you just sort of drifted into stealing because there were things you couldn't afford and you couldn't obtain. That's when I came into contact with um, Charlie Craig. He was a good fence, so he did well. Charlie used to buy a lot of stuff in East London from, and uh, we struck up a friendship. They used to come over with their van and either lock up at Pern Hill. We used to come and load up there, take all the gear back to the East End. And then, of course, his, his brothers, the twins, were younger than him, and they were just coming up and uh, always into some sort of trouble or one thing or another and building up a reputation. An East End bank robber became the Cray's trusted first lieutenant. Albert Donoghue was the go-between in the secret alliances that held the Cray Empire together, an empire founded on violence, as he discovered. I was working with a little crowd in the East End who we were doing security vans and things like that. One of the guys had was collected and tied to a chair and Ronnie Cray put a poke around his face and burnt him. We were saying, who did that, you know, but he wouldn't tell us. So I, I said, if someone done that to me, I'd be out. I'd blow his bloody head off, you know. Anyway, I went to the Twins pub in Bethnal Green. And, uh I was drinking for a little while. I didn't know he'd been sent off for a, a gun. And Reggie shot me in the foot. So I went to the hospital. Then I hear the firm's looking for me. So I went round there, went round to their house. The three, the three crazy were there, Charlie, Reggie and Ronnie. And then Ronnie said, Bill, why don't you stop all that robbery business and come and get your money with us? On the firm, put me on a pension. If you, if you took the punishment, uh, you was considered a good guy, you know. The only thing to do was to go on my toes over to the east end of London. It was like crossing that little bit of water was was a different world, you know, it was a different area. It was, um, the, the, the police wouldn't know you or recognise you in the street. In South London I was known very well. So to go over there it, you felt safe. And the twins and Charlie, they fixed me up with a flat right opposite the, the Blind Beggars pub. 
I lived there. I was indebted to the twins in a way for looking after me, and which they did. They took care of me. And um, uh, of course, they, they was also propping bits of business to me at the same time. Under the wing of the craze, Foreman took the next step up the criminal ladder. Life on the run put him in the midst of other ruthless and committed villains, men from the Shabines and dice games of the East End that Foreman forged into a gang, a heavy mob that set its sights on cash targets. Their activities made the front pages, including this spectacular failure. In December 1961, Foreman's gang attacked a bank van carrying wages worth today over a million pounds. PC Ted Buckle and his dog Flash were in the van. We were hit on three sides as I came off my seat. I saw somebody jumping out of the lorry in front on the near side with a crash helmet on and goggles. And then I saw other people coming out with pickaxe handles, also with helmets on. And we had a couple of big vans and a lorry that uh, reversed back into the front of the van. We had to come along the side of it in another van and we tore down the side of it and smashed the side windows. Because there was like half a dozen guys in the back and uh, caused a bit of confusion. There were two on our side at that moment, smashing in the windows. Obviously their intention was to keep us inside that vehicle. I said, I'm going out with my dog. As I opened up the door and started getting out, my dog automatically leapt at the first person who was at that moment bringing the pickaxe handle down to hit the vehicle again, changed direction and hit the dog straight on the head. And I instantly went for one of these fellows with the pickaxe handle, spun him out, put my arm round his neck and held him in a neck lock. But out, out jumped the, uh, the police officer and his dog, a uh, big C copper, and uh, that was okay, but the copper was fighting with one or the other firm, and uh, the dog was biting lumps out of his ass, you know, while we got the chain in the back and ripped the two back doors off. And uh, the doors came off like a bit of butter and uh, fell in the middle of the road. And then we, when we tried to get in the back of the van to get the money, which was laying there in the, in the big leather cricket bags, all lined up, we had already cash on wage packets. But two guards were standing there in a firing position with these two guns, two Berettas. It turned the tables then. If you want a bullet in the head, yeah, you know, and then he climbed up in the back of the van because the bullets were flying all around the street. It wasn't the robbers using the guns, it was, it was the guards uh, protecting the money. And there's one of our firm crawling around on his hands and knees. And uh, he's been shot right through the head, in, in one side and out the other, it's gone. I saw these men running towards the getaway van, the back door was open, all jumping in. And then one of them shouted something, and they all came back out of that vehicle with their pickaxe handles. At that moment, I knew that I had a serious problem, that they intended to get at me to get their other person away. I knew my life was at stake. They meant it to take me out. They started raining blows on me and I had to let him go. And once I let go, they just turned and ran. So I still have scars on my head. Uh, I couldn't, I'm left-handed and I couldn't use my left arm at all and I thought it was just broken. But in fact, of course, they'd numbed it completely. The failed raid left the police with plenty of forensic evidence. In the back of one of the raiders' vans, they found the fingerprint of a known criminal. It was on this gas bottle. Foreman's gang needed a false alibi. Only an unimpeachable witness could convince a jury that the thief was elsewhere at the time of the raid. The Cray twins had the solution. The twins that I found a particular doctor who, who came and gave evidence for one of, my, one of the people put, put the, the, the chap in his surgery at the time of the robbery. So there was no way they could put him at the scene. So naturally he, he was found guilty of um, accessory before the fact. And uh, it was going three years. Instead of? Of 15. In the struggle that followed, one of the bandits was shot. At the same time, the police constable 
was injured and he is now in hospital. As far as we know, no money was taken and the gang made their getaway carrying with them the wounded man. We all came away looking at our wounds. Also, the man who, who was shot was seriously injured. You can't go to hospital, you can't do anything, because you're just offering him up and putting him inside for the rest of his life. Because I had a, a private doctor who I, I could trust and got him round to inject him and try and prevent any further damage, but it was uh, too serious. And uh, that was the end of I'm afraid that, that was the end of the, the guy. And um, we had to deal with it ourselves. We had a little sideline of the smuggling, which was down in New Haven, bringing watches over from Belgium and France, going, out, going down to sea in a fishing boat, you know, a very safe old boat. So we had that facility open to us from the old fisherman who was down there, and uh, that's where we actually disposed of him. Took him out, he knew all the shipping lanes and the, and the fishing lanes where it was safe to put down anybody. and. Um, wrapped up the right way and a bit of chicken wire and stuff, you know. So that is the way to do it, way down. And that was, that's what happened. people have you personally dispatched in that way? Uh, it sounds a bit uh, gruesome, Frank, to talk about that. More than one? Two? Yeah. 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 London was less security conscious in the 1960s, and the craze were a magnet for any employee with a grudge. With inside information, Foreman's gang could simply sneak through a door in the lunch hour and come away with an enormous prize. They then made a cool getaway with 40 bars of gold worth £200,000 and they closed all the doors behind them to leave no trace. The Twids also gave me some Charles Pixley on this particular occasion. There was um, half a tonne of gold in gold bars delivered there. And uh, it was given to me and uh, we went to work and we, we, we got it, you know, the half tonne of gold, which was, was good, nice, sweet. And um, the twins was happy, everyone was happy. So I was indebted to the, them again, once again. And of course they, they, were, they got their, their corner, they got their whack. Foreman's share meant he could turn down the great train robbery just three months later in August 1963. But he became intimately involved in the aftermath because of his relationship with Frank Williams, the deputy head of Scotland Yard's elite flying squad. Williams was hunting the train robbers, and he was Foreman's kind of copper. I had a good relationship with Frank Williams. I knew him from back in the 50s when he was a DI in Kennington when I had the club in Lambeth Walk. You could never bribe him on offering money. He would never do anything with money. But he would say, uh, if, if they want to come in, they come in and I'll treat them fair and I'll treat them on what the evidence is. Most of the great train robbers were caught and sentenced to an unheard of 30 years in prison. Some of them, including Buster Edwards, had got away and fled the country. Three years later, he was tired of life on the run and wanted to come home, even if it meant prison. He planned to return some of the loot in exchange for a lighter sentence. Freddie Foreman was the only man he knew with the police contacts to fix it. On September the 19th, 1966, £50,000 of Buster's money turned up in a phone box. The public was puzzled. Many wondered how much of the £50,000 was to enrich the flying squad and how much to return to the post office. Nobody was quite sure of the truth. I met Buster and flew out to Germany and met him in uh, Cologne. And then uh, I arranged for him to come back 
and give yourself up to Frank Williams in my public house. I found Frank, he came round and the bus got a fair shake. He, got, he wasn't verbaled up or fitted up with any evidence. And he got half the sentence. He got, instead of 30 years, he got 15, which was, was something you could cope with and handle. Foreman was carving out a unique position for himself in the underworld. On one hand, he had the support and friendship of the craze. On the other, an open line to the two top detectives in the flying squad. I mean, Frank Williams was hoping to be the uh, head of the flying squad when Tommy Butler retired. He was ambitious in that respect. And you and Frank negotiated that oh, we deal ne from negotiated. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, was, I was taking uh, Tommy Butler and Frank to the Simpsons in the stand and uh, buying them lunch and expensive bottles of wine and everything, you know. In September 67, there was pressure to jail the London gangsters. Chief Superintendent Leonard Reed was given the task of building a squad to tackle the craze. He did not subscribe to the belief, common among detectives at the time, that you need a thief to catch a thief. Do you think that uh, Freddie Foreman and Frank Williams had a proper relationship? Well, it was a relationship that other police officers have indulged in. I don't particularly think it was a, a very healthy relationship at all. You never actually joined the Flying Squad, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't want to join the Flying Squad. Any particular reason? Well, it was just that, that uh, I didn't like the activities of some of the members of the Flying Squad and uh, when one was working as, as one was expected to with a team, it was very difficult not to become embroiled in some of the activities that they got up to. And I felt that I could survive much easily and better on my own. Corrupt activities. Yes. In part two, the Craze and Freddie Foreman throw the flying squad off the scent as they descend into a spiral of increasing violence and then murder. In January 1965, Freddie Foreman became a murderer after his brother George was targeted in an underworld vendetta. Two villains, armed with a shotgun, blasted George Foreman in the groin. When he opened his front door to them, he nearly died. The information network of the craze helped Freddie Foreman take his revenge. The attackers were tracked to a Bethnal Green pub. One of them was a small-time thief called Ginger Marks. Foreman and his mob raced to the pub and gunned down Marks in the street. They bundled the corpse into the back of the car. All that was left at the scene were Marks' spectacles and a pool of blood. Naturally, I was, um, I wanted revenge. I know it was pay, payback time, you know, for me. And uh, as soon as I got it over with, I couldn't live with it, I had to do it. I mean, the police knew and everyone in the underworld really knew what went down there and they didn't need the brains of Lloyd George to work it out but proving it, it was another thing and everybody who was associated with me was under investigation and, and getting their, their doors kicked in and, and uh, spun, all their properties spun, you know. And nobody would talk because they feared you? Well, and they never, it was, it was just not fear, it was a, out of um, respect they never spoke, to. that's what, what it was all about. The body took the boat journey from New Haven. The police had nothing to go on. Freddie Foreman had got away with murder. It made a deep impression on the craze. The twins, I suppose they looked at it as um, an achievement in a way. Should use a different word there, probably. Not the achievement is to get to away. Get, to do something that was serious, the, the, the major capital thing you can do in, in this life, and uh, and to do it successfully, I suppose. I said, well, you know, you mustn't mess with those people because you know what happened. In early 1966, the whisper on the street was that the Craze and a South London gang led by the Richardson brothers were about to go to war. But a fight at this Catford nightclub put pay to all that. The Richardson gang suffered a severe and unexpected defeat at the hands of a group of armed local villains. Eddie Richardson and Mad Frankie Fraser, the gang's chief enforcer, were in hospital with gunshot wounds. The shootout left one man dead and others seriously injured. 
The defeat of the Richardsons robbed Ronnie Cray of the violent night out he craved. But he was not to be thwarted. Police are still searching for the gunman who shot a man in the bar of an East End saloon. The dead man was 38 and married. Detectives have Less than 24 hours later, the Cray Intelligence Network passed Ronnie Cray the news that a straggler from the Richardson camp, George Cornell, was drinking in the blind beggar. Ronnie Cray strode in and shot him dead in front of a dozen terrified customers. Ronnie Cray was arrested and Freddie Foreman went to lean on the witnesses. His intervention, backed by his reputation as an unconvicted murderer, ensured that the first police investigation ran into a wall of silence. I went to see them afterwards and uh, you know, just to confirm that, that what, what was being said is it's nice if you're in the toilet, you, you hear a gun, you don't come out. And uh, if you don't see anything, you, you can't uh, say anything about it. You were there to guarantee the unwritten law that you don't talk. Yeah, yeah, to that extent, yeah. Freddie Foreman and the Crays were forming a unique alliance in the underworld. The fear they generated allowed them to penetrate London's clubland and take their extortion rackets into the West End unopposed. Mafia money from America helped open the fashionable Colony Club and the Crays and Foreman were partners. It seemed they had struck gold. I would go up to the West End and collect from the clubs and I was after the Colony. The Colony was paying three grand a quarter. Albert used to bring money from the Colony Club and different businesses and Starlight Club and this one and that one. It's always bringing money up because we was involved in, uh, in lots of different enterprises. The twins and Foreman would do bits and pieces of business. Not, not always uh, gang stuff, but uh, it was like tit for tat. You handle my business and we can be somewhere else. We can be at the dogs, we can be talking to the vicar. Whichever kept the other person in their status quo. You know. How formidable an alliance would that be in the underworld at that time? Pretty strong, very strong. I was a sort of backup to the to the craze, and and people knew that, and they knew that I was very close with them, and uh, their enemies became your enemies. People were prepared to go to war with with the twins. I think they, they had second thoughts when they knew I was uh, behind them. And by the mid-60s, what was it you would do for each other? Well, we were, we were prepared uh, to do probably anything that was asked and, and were there any questions. This was the moment when the Cray's view of their own power became so deluded that they planned a crime solely to enhance their reputations. In 1966, they decided to spring Frank Mitchell from Dartmoor Prison. Aged 37, Mitchell was an East Ender who had spent half his life behind bars in violent defiance of authority. He had escaped six times and was nicknamed the Mad Axeman. The system could not handle him and he ended up worse off than many murderers, serving a life sentence with no date of release. The Mitchell myth appealed to the craze. But was it the real man? Mitchell, he'd been birched, he'd been flogged, he'd been certified insane, he'd been in solitary confinement. He'd, he'd had an awful life, really. Uh, and then when he got to uh, Dartmoor, he began to change. Previously, he took great pleasure in assaulting prison officers and, uh, and became, because of that, a kind of a hero amongst his fellow inmates. But then when he realized that he was the man that was suffering all the punishment as the result of that, he realized that there was no percentage in that. And so by the time he, his uh, escape was effected, he was a totally different man altogether. On the 12th of December 1966, Mitchell ran away from a prison working party to rendezvous with two members of the Cray firm who drove him to a hideout in London. Like his previous escapes, this was an act of protest. Mitchell wanted a date of release from his life sentence, but his repeated appeals to the Home Office had all failed, despite the support of the Dartmoor governor. He looked to his home ground for help. 
Mitchell was an East Ender, and the idea was the, the craze could further identify themselves as benefactors, not only to criminals, but to society, by forcing the Home Secretary to give Mitchell a, uh, a date of release and then send him back and say, now we've achieved something, and there again, the Crays have done something that, that is acceptable and commendable as far as the criminal underworld is concerned. So once again, it's reputation. Absolutely, reputation. It was a crime born of vanity, and it went horribly wrong. In the hideout, Mitchell became increasingly desperate. The authorities would not budge, and he found he had swapped one prison for another. The Crays got him a prostitute a club hostess called Lisa Prescott, to calm him down. But Mitchell had tasted freedom and wouldn't give it up. Mitchell refused to go back and then they were confounded. Now what do we do? And so the decision then was taken very clinically, very cold-bloodedly, that they would kill him. And that's what they did. The Cray's invited guest was no longer welcome. Ronnie Cray ordered Mitchell's execution. Reggie Cray, Charlie Cray and Freddie Foreman gathered to work out the details of how to get away with another murder. The motive was clear, self-preservation. Frank Mitchell was in danger in everyone's future in a sense because you just didn't know how far away it was going to go. It protected everybody from getting arrested because that's, that was going to be the final outcome. Within hours, Foreman's gang was on the road with murder in mind. They had a stake in this too. Mitchell had become a threat to the alliance with the Craigs and everything that went with it. They were benefiting from the activities twins were creating in this empire where, where it looked very lucrative and we were going to get money from it. And uh, it could have led to much bigger and better things. Was it put to you in those terms? That, that was obvious without even you know, even discussing it. Yeah. They wanted your expertise in this, and your expertise was to make the problem, the evidence, the body disappear. Everything to disappear. Mitchell trusted Albert Donahue, the man who had taken him off the moor. It became his job to persuade Mitchell to leave the hideout and get into the van in nearby Ladysmith Avenue. Donahue insists he did not know what would happen next. Freddy Foreman and another man shot Mitchell dead as the van pulled away. Donahue witnessed the killing and afterwards realised why Foreman got the job. The, a pretty well-known shooter on the fellow Melfi Gerrard, he'd done a few, someone talks about half a dozen. I'm pretty sure they did the Ginger Marks business. Then disposal. No body, no crime. That was the belief. taken down to New Haven without well, the smuggling operation we had. It was always a facility there to use if we needed it, uh, which became uh, very useful. And uh, that's where we did, where we actually disposed of it. So how did I come to do that sort of thing? Well, a little bit of madness there myself, you know? You think you're untouchable. If you do things right, you'll, you'll get away with it. And would have got away with it if it wasn't for people opening their mouths, you know? Would you be a happier man now if you had got away with it? No. I'd been a happier man now if I hadn't have done it. And if I'd... I never had to commit these sort of crimes. But I'm not proud of the fact what I've done. I feel sorry and I apologise to their families and anybody that was left behind. It's late in the day to apologise, but I sincerely do. Twelve days after his escape, Mitchell was dead. But the biggest manhunt in British criminal history carried on. The public, and more importantly the politicians, wanted results. So the Flying Squad was put in overall command of the operation to find Mitchell. They quickly concluded he was alive and safely out of the country. There was uh, an, an individual officer, a chief inspector in the flying squad, who was identified as being the man that would collate all this information about Mitchell. And he was very convinced 
that Mitchell was in Ireland. Now, where he got that information from, I don't know. The officer involved was Frank Williams. Along with another detective, Williams sent a memo, which has been made public for this program, asserting strongly that Mitchell was undoubtedly in Ireland. In the memo, addressed to the commander of London's detective force, the officers claimed that two entirely separate sources had confirmed that Mitchell was in the Irish Republic. It said the information was undoubtedly correct. There was letters written to say that he's still alive. They was trying to make inroads to people who have influenced to let, filter information back to get back to the police. Would you have taken the opportunity to reinforce that reinforce idea? It. With Frank Williams and the police, mm. that um, Mitchell was safe and abroad. Yeah, uh, I can't. Even, I mean that that was uh, banded around uh, all over London, and of course I, I'd give it credence if I had it. I, I'd say, yeah, it's possibly that's right. You know, that's the best best thing for him. The police swallowed the criminal's line completely leaving Mitchell's family to cope with the ugly rumours that began to circulate about his ultimate fate. There's one minute one person was saying he was um, in the Bow Road flyover. Someone else said he was fed to the pigs. Someone else said he was down in a sand pit. Uh, he had been cremated in a cemetery. Just all different rumours. So it was all going to work because like, we used to be, fo be followed by people like in um, oh, what, what newspapers newspapers and that and um, like you just get pointed out and things like that it wasn't very nice for us pointed out why I mean what were they well, saying they just say like that the Frank Mitchell sisters and things like that the Mad Axeman sisters no I didn't say the Mad Axeman sisters they did did they I can't remember that so and, and what was that like to endure it well, it wasn't very nice, yeah, but then I didn't care that. because we knew he wasn't a mad X-Men, so it didn't really bother us. What, what would you say to people who enjoy the myth that's grown up around the gangsters and the criminals of that time? Well, I think it's a load of crap, in other words. I they wouldn't enjoy it so much if it happened to their family, family, any of their families. The craze had now got away with murder, twice they were beginning to acquire a taste for it. In part three, Reggie Cray gets his own grisly initiation. Reggie Cray went out to kill so as to build up his bad name. He became a murderer at this North London house. The unsuspecting victim was Jack the Hat McVitie, a fellow thief and local heavy. He was lured to a party in the basement, and Reggie stabbed him to death. Once Ronnie had done Cornell, he's always screaming at Reggie. I've done mine, it's time you've done yours. You know. A dozen witnesses helped to affirm his new status as a killer. The Cray twins walked off the scene, leaving the rest of the firm to clear up the mess. In the panic that followed, the corpse was dumped in a car just yards from Freddie Foreman's doorstep. He later served a 10-year sentence for disposing of the body. As I explained to Ronnie, that's me finished. I don't want to be involved. I don't want to know anything about anything in the, in the future. No more. Because I wasn't going to play the part of an undertaker to clear up the mess after they... Uh, on one of their crazy nights out, you know? I knew that Ronnie, his temperament and his, he'd be phoning me up or, or sending people over or something every, you know, twos and threes in the morning, he'd just iron somebody out and want me to clear up after him. I said, oh, this is it, you know. No, no, don't stop going around shooting people or thinking you get away with it, you know. I thought to yourself, where's it going to end, you know? There was a, a real feeling of foreboding. The atmosphere was such, I couldn't see into the future where I could before, you know. I'd, I used to plan ahead, and, but now I was uh, in a position where I, I didn't know where it was going to lead to. Frank Mitchell was the, that was the writing on the wall. 
if um, I could see that they was cracking up, their nerves were jangled and, you know, their nerves all popping pills and stuff like that. They was in a terrible state. And, uh, I mean, I did try and clear up the situation so that, that they could survive. Chief Superintendent Nipper Reed was now targeting the craze with a task force of over 20 officers, each one hand-picked because he feared corrupt officers would leak details of his inquiry to the craze. So he based his team at Tintagel House, south of the Thames, and well away from the rumour mill of the Met. I knew that if I remained at Scotland Yard, the likelihood was, the likelihood was, that information from my office would find its way back to the Cray organisation. I wanted people that I knew and could trust in my squad and I, want, and I told all of them that they must under no circumstances uh, visit Scotland Yard alone, that they would go in pairs so that they couldn't be confronted by one of their alleged friends. Nipper Reed was fighting a 30-year-old culture of sleaze, which encouraged detectives and villains to come to a cosy accommodation with each other used to meet up with people in the flying squad the same as you did with other villains in there. You walk in a pub and they'd be in the other bar and they'd send a drink over, you'd send a drink over and, and, you, and you go sit there, they'd probably be kicking your door down on the weekend and, and swagging you down the neck, you know, putting you on IDs and there were police officers, obviously, you could straighten out, but I mean, we, we, won't, we don't want to talk about them because uh, they did a service and uh, if they get an arrest and, it, and they get a conviction and if they could drop out a little bit of the, the nasty stuff and, and the evidence, well, that was, that was fair enough. Foreman should have been the Flying Squad's number one target. As a busy and determined armed robber, he was precisely the sort of criminal the squad had been set up to deal with, not make deals with. Foreman was leading a charmed life some detectives thought they knew why. Freddie Foreman had a very close contact with a man who was the deputy head of the flying squad at that time. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, he was an informant of some kind for that man and it was probably a reciprocal arrangement and, and based on that he was probably forewarned of, about certain matters that uh, uh, he may have been accu accused of or suspected of. How many convictions have you got for robbery? Oh, none. None? None. Was there an explanation for that? The explanation is uh, there's no evidence to prove, prove that I did these things. How yeah. many times have you been tried for murder then? Twice. And what's been the result on those occasions? I was acquitted on two occasions. In May 1968, Nipper Reed and his team arrested the craze in their mother's new council flat. The timing was not of his choosing. The police had a mole in the firm who told them that another murder was being planned. The firm was rounded up and ended up in Brixton prison. But Nipper's case against them was not yet strong. He had no signed statements and no forensic evidence. He had to use a mixture of bluff and guile to make his case. This place is the chapel uh, of Brixton Prison and just beyond the door at the bottom is a wing where all these prisoners were kept and I would come late at night and booking as, as the, the Reverend X, Y or Z and, uh, and they would be brought to me quietly without their shoes, slipping along these corridors and down to see me because it was important from their point of view that they were never seen to be giving any kind of intelligence or statement to me, otherwise their life was in jeopardy, they all understood that. The Crays only knew one tactic, fear. Now that they were behind bars, their idea of a defence against the murder charges was simple, to terrorise members of the firm into pleading guilty to them. I show Reggie my notes, he looks at him, and he ripped them up. The Ronnie says, what we've decided is uh, you stand up for Mitchell and we'll take all the other stuff. All the other stuff. Once people know they're off the murders, no one's going to...
accuse them of grievous bodily harm or fraud or anything, you know, they're going to get probation. So I, I, I said, I, I thought and I went, no. And that was it, you know, temperature dropped. I had a visit the afternoon. My mother came up with the baby. As I passed the baby back, I gave her this note. Like, get, go to uh, Bow Street, tell Nipper Reed. He can have the business if he comes to see me. Once Donahue had turned his back on the craze, the case against them began to build. But the fear lingered on. Detectives from Nipper's squad trace Lisa, the prostitute who spent four nights with Mitchell and heard the shots that killed him. They picked her up in the early hours of the morning and made south for Tintagel House, away from Scotland Yard, in an unmarked car. She knew enough about London to know that when she came out over Lambert Bridge, she should have turned left, and she turned right. So she was convinced that my officers were members of the Cray Gang that had come to pick her up. Terrified, she opened the door of the car that she was in and ran to the parapet, trying to throw herself over into the river before she was dragged back. And the reason that she did that was, although this was two years later, she was still terrified because she had been told, don't forget, wherever you are in the world, we will find you. And if you open your mouth, you'll be dead. And so she, that threat still applied as far as she was concerned. She was still terrified to the extent that she would throw herself out of a moving car. The Mitchell trial was the third murder charge the Craze had faced at the Old Bailey. The twins were already serving life sentences for killing Cornell and McVitty. It was a confusing trial. There was no body, no forensic evidence to speak of, and the crime was nearly three years old. What's more, the principal prosecution witness was a member of the Cray gang. Foreman and the Crays flatly denied all knowledge of Mitchell's murder, and the jury acquitted them. I went to the trial with my sister, but my sister went up on the dock, as you call it, and I sat in the back, and as she said a piece, like, you know, she brought forward, she, she spat at the craze and called them pigs. We thought they should have been found guilty. We was all upset. Do you feel you've had justice? No, we've not had justice. Frankie's still missing, we don't know where he is. We've never been able to bury Frankie. The Craze and Foreman got away with murder because the jury faced an impossible choice, which villain to believe. Albert Donahue in the witness box was a member of the firm who had originally been charged with Mitchell's murder. Freddie Foreman in the dock was only identified as the killer by Donahue. Who to believe is still a puzzle. When you delivered him to the van in which he was shot dead and then Foreman's gang allowed you to walk away and that's pretty compelling evidence that you knew what was going to happen. Well, yeah, it might seem that way, but uh, on the other hand, it could be... You could take it exactly the opposite way. How so? That uh, I didn't know, but I've been involved, so that was it, I've got to keep my mouth shut, you know which is the way the twins were. They, practically all their murders were done openly in front of witnesses. Did Albert Donahue know that there was a plan to kill Frank Mitchell? Yeah, well, he knew that that, that was going to happen, whether it was then and there or ten minutes or half an hour later, he knew that was the, the outcome. If I'd known, I could have gone missing or something like that, you know, or been late. Could have cocked it up anyway, you know. I could have said I couldn't separate him from the girl, bring the girl out. They go, oh, they don't want a double, double job. So they'd have probably backed out. Any a million things I could have done to stop it, had I known. So you believed that he was going to the country? On that night, yeah. I assumed that sometime later he probably would go. 
Would you have gone driving to the country with Alfie Gerard and Freddie Foreman in a van without windows? <laughs> no. No. Well, there's always the element of um, someone doing the talking, and which in this case is the only reason that it, the truth uh, was found out. When you look at uh, the position that Albert Donaghy was in, he was actually charged with the murder and, and asked to take it on board and, uh, and put his hands up to it. He can't ask anybody to do that. Nobody is going to put his hands up to a murder he's not committed, even though he may be an accessory to the fact. I don't blame him. I just think that he could have done it, done it differently. And he, he, all he needed to said uh, to have said was that he, he took him to the back of a van with the engine running and light shine and he opened uh, the, the door and he climbed in and he shut the door and walked away. Donahue was sentenced to two years for aiding Mitchell's escape and released on time served. The craze and foreman went to jail because of other murders, but it left a bitter aftertaste for those seeking justice for Frank Mitchell. And this was the one that I wanted a conviction on because I must, during the course of that investigation, found sympathy for Mitchell because of his situation, because of the life that he'd led. And, and I wanted desperately and badly a conviction. And I was very disappointed because I believed and still do that Donaghy was telling the truth. This film, shot by Nipper Reed, shows the craze final sight of the outside world as they were driven up the M1 to start their life sentences. For Frank Mitchell, there was no justice, even in death. But the investigation of his murder destroyed the underworld alliance between the Krays and Freddy Foreman. That partnership made the gangland of the 60s unique, and its downfall stifled the growth of organized crime. The murder of Mitchell was the first really big uh, charge that we made. And that was the breakthrough. And once we got that one, and that started off, and it began to roll, and we wiped everybody up then, all the whole of the gang, and Freddie Foreman were enmeshed in this big sweep, and then people started to crack a little bit. So in that sense, yes, Frank Mitchell did get his revenge, because he, he uh, you could say quite, quite convincingly, was the man that started it all off and, and uh, caused the destruction of the Grey Empire. Thank you.